okay, you guys are doing something really interesting. Let's go talk to some customers, both on the federal side and even on the commercial side, right, where we have some advisors who can tell us, like, is this a fit? Is this actually solving a problem? So, you know, we have some some relationships with folks who've left the government. We can also go talk to some customers who are in the government right now. We've got this commercial, these commercial folks we can talk to, you know, some CISOs from large companies and just get a feel for how important is this to you, right? Like this seems like it's a, a real problem, but is it something anybody's going to allocate budget for right. in the next year or two years? Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by J Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley, in partnership with Lomitech, and sponsored by Homeward Ventures, Hippo Insurance, Upwest, Hillel at Stanford, Leap, and Birthright Excel. Hello and welcome to another episode of 20 Minute Leaders. Today, I am with Seth Spurgel, managing partner of Merlin Ventures, where he's responsible for identifying cutting-edge companies for Merlin to partner with and invest in. Seth has more than 20 years of experience building, selling, and investing in software and startups. Most recently, Seth was Vice President for Infrastructure Technologies at InQtel, the strategic investment firm of the U.S. intelligence community. Prior to InQtel, Seth was the Vice President of Engineering for ThinkGeek, an online seller and manufacturer of geeky toys and clothing, and also spent 12 years at IBM in roles ranging from software developer to sales manager. Seth Spurgel, welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Michael. Of course. Where are you calling from right now? I am in uh, my lovely basement in Bethesda, Maryland. So just outside of Washington, D.C. Am- amazing. I actually, I, I, I was born in Maryland, but that's, uh, that's besides the point. But I have a, a, a deep place in my heart for it. Today, you're the managing partner of Maryland VC. Uh, you have decades of experience in, in the high-tech field, working with some amazing companies in executive roles. Uh, and, and today, looking more strategically with Maryland, uh, also with, with investments in this world. And so I'm excited to sort of just go, go through your journey and, and pick and choose some, some of those moments where you learn some things about yourself and about, uh, and about, about the world and, and how you've sort of converged to, into working with Merlin and, mm-hmm. and some of the operations that you're doing today. So Seth, maybe take me back a little bit and share with me a little bit about your, about your journey. Sure. So, um, I mean, I've been at Merlin about three years now, but before that, uh, kind of jumped between a few different, uh, roles within the technology space. So start coming out of college, you know, was, was, a a small cog in the giant IBM machine working in their services group, uh, doing, you know, IT development primarily. And, you know, did that for a few years and then, I don't know, was, wasn't loving it. So moved into more of a software strategy role. And as I got more exposure to the company and saw sort of how things were run, realized that a lot of the corporate direction was really coming out of the sales organization at IBM. So decided to make a shift and, and moved into that side of things. Um, so moved into a role selling collaboration software, uh, Lotus Notes back in the day, uh, and some other stuff into the, the U.S. government primarily. So um, defense and intelligence agencies. And it was great. I got to know the customers really well, and it was just an amazing problem set to work with. Um, but eventually realized that that sales and sales management just wasn't really what I wanted to do with my life. Right? I really missed being closer to the technology. Uh, mm. And so after a few years of doing that, I had a friend who had been a mentor at IBM who had left a few years earlier, who was now the VP of engineering at a toy company, reach out and say, hey, you have any interest in, in coming over here and kind of taking over for me as I go on and do my next thing? And I said, yes, a toy company sounds like a, a nice change after, after 12 years at IBM. So um, went over to a company called Think Geek for about two years. Uh, it was a, a company that made geeky toys and clothing, a lot of like sci-fi related stuff. Uh, and you know, it was, it was an e-commerce company. So really running the engineering team that was building the platform that, that ran the company. Um, so a bit of a trial by fire at first, right? Learned a ton, uh, and it was awesome, right? I mean, being able to, to have fun and learn something new and, and really, uh, just work with some great people. So did that for a couple of years. Um, and then, uh, as, as that company, you know, ran into the problems, Ended up uh, having a, another colleague from IBM reach out, who is now at InQtel, which is a, a VC for the U.S. government. Uh, and he asked, "Yeah, me, what is that about?" I, you know, I read that in your bio, and I was like, "Wow, this is so freaking cool!" A, a VC for the U.S. intelligence, you know, side. Yeah, so it, it's a neat founding story, right? So around 1999 or so, um, it, it was primarily the CIA at that point. 
took a look around and realized that whereas, you know, if you go back to like the 60s and, you know, you know, for a while after that, even the majority of R&D was really being funded by the government and all the amazing innovation was coming out of government right. around that, you know, towards the, the end of the, you know, 1990s, they, they realized innovation has shifted, right? It's no longer coming out of government labs. It's coming out of Silicon Valley. It's coming out of yeah. startups and we're missing it all. So the CIA actually uh, asked some, some business leaders to come together and create this nonprofit venture capital fund to go and find amazing startups that they could invest in and help bring into the, the U.S. government so that they could have access to this amazing technology. Um, so, I mean, that was, what, 22 years ago at this point, uh, it, it, and it's been growing ever since then. Um, but it, it, it's an amazing company. It was a lot of fun. You know, the, the cool thing about it is the diversity of stuff that we got to do, right? Um, yeah. Because we're, we would work with so many different agencies and, and problem sets, right? Um, just the, the team I got to be part of was was an awesome place to learn, right? Like I had a guy who had a PhD in botany sitting next to me and another guy who'd founded, you know, battery startups, right? And so I could just, I could walk down the hallway and get like PhD level discussions with any of these different topics and learn so much on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that was a, a great way to, to really get an introduction to, to venture capital um, and just learn about all the different types of technology out there that, that, you know, were changing the world. Um, Incredible. And, and obviously, you know, doing that with, with you know, doing with it in a, in a governmental setting as well and having the dissonance. And I'm sure that, that that was quite a unique experience. How did you get to Merlin from there? Yeah. So I was there for about five years. Um, and like I said, it was, it was amazing. Right. But after five years, I, I started to see some of the limits of it. Right. The, the challenge of being at a company that's been around for 20 years is they have a certain way of doing things. Right. And, uh, you know, you can only change so much. And I, I, you know, there were certain things I really wanted to to change, to try, right? Um, sort of spread my wings and have a little bit more say in the direction of something like that. At the same time, Merlin, which was a company that had been around for 25 years, really focusing on the federal space, had had a lot of success working with later stage companies, right? So doing some amazing stuff with like Forescout and CyberArk and Netscope. And they realized, you know, given what we do, it would be amazing if we could find some earlier stage companies that could that are you know, sort of at the leading edge of technology, but that have a strong complement to the stuff we're already doing. And if we could build up our own VC and find those companies and help bring them into this market and really help change, you know, what the government can do. So, you know, in a lot of ways, kind of similar to what, what Incutel does, right? Trying to find these really innovative startups and bringing them into the federal market. For Merlin, right, we're much more focused on the non-IC agencies, which means we can open up a broader aperture, right? We can, we can look a lot more at, at, you know, foreign companies, you know, coming out of Israel and, and, be more successful in actually helping them come into these these agencies. Um, so I had a, a friend that was working at Merlin, and, and you know she introduced me to uh, the CEO, and we started talking. And he sort of laid out his vision for what he wanted to do. And and you know for me, it, it, you know after a few conversations, as I started to see what what the opportunity was and the resources that we could really leverage to do some amazing things, it just I, it, it was the right time to to leave. You know I I'd been thinking about you know what do I want to do after Incutel and, and this came up and this was, you know, this was just a golden opportunity to do something. Very, and so, so how does your day-to-day -day look like right now? So, um, you know, it, so we opened up an office in Israel, actually, uh, in, yep. in January of this year, which has been amazing, right? It's been great to try to invest in Israel from the U.S. You know, we, we found some amazing companies, but it's, it's, it's a whole different ballgame when you actually have somebody on the ground there that, that is going to these, you know, running to these companies on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but... I will say that it also makes a lot more time zone challenges uh, when you've got a team in Israel and, and then, you know, I'm here in the U U.S. Uh, so typically most of my mornings are spent on the phone with our team in Israel or with companies in Israel talking, trying to decide, you know, who, which of these companies are potential fits for us. Um, and then I'd say that most of the afternoon is spent more with the, the, the parent company, Merlin Cyber side of things, working with them to understand what are the different types of needs they're seeing across the customer set, right? Are there large programs coming out that have a need for certain types of technologies that, that maybe we've seen already, or maybe we should be looking for, um, you know, so, so it, it's a nice balance, right? Sort of straddling those two, because on the one hand, I get to see the need. And on the other hand, I get to see the innovation and I can try to pair those up. 
And so are, are you, is it sort of that you're articulating the needs and then finding companies that are, that are suiting those needs? Or is it that you're open, you're open to discovering new needs through these companies? Because, you know, as, as, a, as an investor, I, I find all, a lot of times that, you know, I'm being presented with an idea for a company and all of a sudden I'm discovering that there's this whole new problem that I, that I never even knew existed. Yes. Yes. I mean, it's certainly some of that too, right? So I think, you know, the, the perfect day is when, you know, I'm sitting in a meeting and somebody's talking about this new program coming out of DHS that has a need for threat hunting. And then I go happen to hop on a call, you know, that day and, and hear about this amazing new technology. And I can run into the next room and say, you've got to go talk to these guys. But yeah, absolutely. There've been some of those as well. Um, there's a company in our portfolio called Sepio that does some really cool stuff that I had never even thought of as a problem. And, and like they showed me a, the first time we met, they showed me a mouse they'd found on a, a air gap network that had a cellular modem inserted into it. So like, you know, even though the mouse is, the computer sitting on a you know disconnected network, somebody is remotely hopping into it and controlling it. Wow. And that just, you know, that was one of those where like, that's obviously a problem that, that the US government should be concerned about. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's thinking about it today, but we need to help them think about it, right? So those are the sort of companies that I love. The ones that are, you know, it's not just we're doing something slightly better or slightly cheaper than someone else. It's, it's we're opening up a whole new market space and solving a problem that people haven't even realized yet. And is that usually something that, that you understand intuitively as you meet them over one or two conversations? Or does that, does that require, you know, a really deep, in, you know, research and, and a lot of heavy lifting to come to this conviction that, okay, this, because it's, it's a scary thesis to come and say, this company is actually perhaps opening up a whole new vertical for this world. Yeah, no, it, it is, right? And it, it, the benefit of opening up a whole new vertical is, you know, it's something that, that, you know, there aren't a lot of other people doing, but it also means it's not something that people have necessarily budgeted for yet or are thinking about yet, right? And it's, it's a challenge. Um, so I, I think there's, there's a, there's a balance there. Right. Um, and, you know, in, in the case of Sepio, frankly, we invested and we thought we need to go sell this in the U S government today. Right. And, and it took us a year to really educate the market and get the company ready. Right. And before we could really bring that in. Um, but you know, th there's other cases where, uh, so, but in terms of your question of like, how did, how did we know that that was the right fit? That one was just yeah. one, I think. I'm probably, probably more sensitive to that because of my background with InQtel, right? Of like knowing right. the sorts of things. Like when I hear air gap network and attack, that that scares the crap out of me. Um, but other ones are a bit more nuanced. And there it really is, okay, you guys are doing something really interesting. Let's go talk to some customers, both on the federal side and even on the commercial side, right? Where we have some advisors who can tell us like, is this a fit? Is this actually solving a problem? So, you know, we have some some relationships with, Folks who've left the government, we can also go talk to some customers who are in the government right now. We've got this commercial, these commercial folks we can talk to, you know, some CISOs from large companies, and just get a feel for how important is this to you, right? Like this seems like it's a, a real problem, but is it something anybody's going to allocate budget for right. in the next year or two years? Um, and that's actually one of the one of the things I like. That's a big difference between Inkytel. Inkytel is actually a nonprofit, right? So they were created by the government to help you know, bring these startups in. And it's, it's, it's a great position to be in. But I actually kind of like the fact that Merlin as a strategic investor for Merlin Cyber, you know, the parent company is really kind of a, very well aligned with these startups, right? We want to help them sell into the federal market because that's, that's how our parent company makes its money, right? So we want to see these startups succeed, not just as an investor, but also, you know, as, as a business partner for them. What 100%. Now, what, what happens the day after the investment, you know, from your end? Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the the things we've been mulling over in our mind, right, is we've had some later stage investments, we've had some earlier stage investments, and, you know, we've, we've learned a lot of lessons as we've been doing this, is exactly when the right time to invest is, right? Because, you know, if you invest, you know, later stage in a company, right, like, let's say a, a B, they're pretty far along, you're probably not going to have an opportunity to really shape the right. product direction all that significantly, but they're closer to being ready for the federal market. If you invest at a seed or, or you know early you know near an A, um, it's going to be a while before they're really ready for federal. But you have an, a lot more of an opportunity to really help them strategize around how to get there. And so I think where we're really leaning into more now is we want to invest early in these companies, and we don't want them to go into federal on day one, right? Like going into federal really requires a lot of resources, and it's typically not the best use of a startup that's at an early stage that hasn't really built up their commercial traction yet. It's something, but, but it's something they should be thinking about, right? In terms of, hey, what should, what should I be thinking about in terms of product direction? 
what should I be thinking about in terms of even investors I take in, right? Like what are all the things that are eventually yes. going to bite me if and when I want to go into the federal market? Um, so typically speaking, when we invest, right, we'll, we'll, we'll have an honest conversation with them and say like, are you ready for federal or not right now? No, that's, that's good. That's actually probably better in, you know, in a lot of these situations, but let's review your product. Let's talk about the architecture. Let's understand what are the things you may need to adjust going forward. And let's, you know, again, we're focused on federal, but we have some commercial ties. So let's introduce you where we can, right? Let's leverage our network of, of you know, advisors out of these Fortune 500 companies. Let's, you know, let's leverage our marketing team and, and, you know, sort of review your marketing plan and see how we can help on the commercial marketing as you get started in the U.S., right? Um, and then, you know, again, it's it's just that constant sort of discussion with them to help steer them and, and let them make decisions, but also try to get them... Um, so, you know, just some awareness, right? Even if they're not ready for federal yet, we should be starting that discussion, especially when it's a, a category defining company, like we talked about, where nobody's even thinking about this yet. We need to be saying, how do we get you in front of people who will be making that decision in a year or two when you're ready for the federal market? So they know that this is a problem they need to be thinking about. So, you know, helping them in terms of events and, and you know, speaking slots and things like that as well, even though they may not have a product that's ready to sell into the federal market today. I think that I think that makes a lot of sense. If you look back now, you know, sort of at your childhood, uh, you know, middle school, elementary school, what really sparked your curiosity? What really, you know, what really fascinated you as a kid? Yeah, so I mean, I have to guess that that given the the type of people you interview, you get this answer a lot. But I mean, I, I was fascinated by computers as you know as long as I can remember, right? So I remember, I guess it, I. I I, I had to look it up to see what year this got discontinued, but um, the TI 994A, which was an early, you know, personal computer, I remember it got it, it got discontinued in 1984. So they were dirt cheap, and my dad picked one up for me, and I was I would have been seven at the time, and I mean that was just the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. Right, I could play games on it. I could, I mean, that was pretty much all I could do at age seven at that point on that thing. Right, but um, you know, my dad was taking he was actually going to graduate school at the time uh, and learning, you know, some programming. And so he would like help me, you know, a figure out how to play with it, but also he would like write games for me and, and, you know, really just sort of, um, help me kind of spark the interest in that. I'd always thought like electronics in general were cool, but this was my first, you know, actual computer where I could do stuff, you know, write my own basic programs and just play with it. And from there, it just kept growing. Right. So, um, a few years later, one of our neighbors gave me his old hand, hand me down, uh, Atari computer. Atari actually made computers, not just game systems, but they had wow. computers as well. An 800 XL. Um, and so that one was a little more powerful. He also gave me his beat up old printer that, that wouldn't print any punctuation. So I started, I, I had terrible handwriting as a kid, but I started typing up all my school reports and then I'd go in after the fact and take a pen and put all the periods and commas because the printer wouldn't print them. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the really big thing was uh, it would have been early nineties, you know, probably sophomore year in high school or so, uh, we got a computer, but um, my mother was a, a local high school librarian. And so I knew a bunch of the librarians in the area. And the, the library in our town started a pilot internet system that you could get access to. And so I got connected wow. to that. And it, it was all text-based. It was, you know, I guess we had links as a, a web browser, you know, a text-based web browser, but it was primarily like Gopher and all these other old protocols. And I just, it was the most amazing thing for me, right? Like that just opened up a whole new world. I remember my first day playing with it and I, you know, I, I was clicking around on gopher and I clicked something and it connected me to something in another country. I was like, Holy crap, they're going to get, you know, be all pissed about the long distance fees and everything else so before cool. I realized how the internet actually worked. Um, so yeah, I mean that, that was, that was something that, you know, just kept my interest from, from age seven up until, till now I've, I've, you know, loved just playing with technology and, and, you know, seeing what I could do with it. I love it. And and if you look today at your daily work, what, what is something that really inspires you? I mean, I think going back to the conversation we were having about the type of people I, I like to work with, right? It's, it's people yeah. who can teach me things, right? You know, working, you know, with people that, that have different backgrounds, are in different fields, and, you know, can just teach me something I had no knowledge about that I love. And that's why, you know, not just coworkers, but that's why I love the, the venture space, right? Like working with startups where, you've got people who have amazing ideas and have turned it into a product, right? Have turned it into yeah. something real. To me, that's just, you know, that's so special. And again, it, I like the fact that they can teach me what they're doing, right? Because frankly, the, the best founders are the ones who can explain what they're doing in a way that I can understand yes. um, and, and help make me a, a little bit smarter. Uh, so to me, that's, that's always been exciting. I love it. And if you had to choose a few words to describe yourself, what would they be? 
So let's see. So I, I t- one of my uh, old coworkers made me take a personality test recently, and, and I apparently came up as as uh, one of the primary traits was loyalty. So we'll, we'll start with that. But I think you know pragmatism, you know, pragmatic is, has always been a, a way of how I've looked at problems. Right? I want to do the best possible thing that we can do, but it, but I also want to do something that that is actually going to work in the real world and and you know get stuff done. Um, and then I guess you know there's probably m- mischievous is always you know I, I like to have fun with people as well and. Uh, I guess my wife might call it annoying, but I, I like to say mischievous. Seth, Sam, thank you so much for these 20 minutes. I really, really appreciate it. This was wonderful. Thank and you, Michael. Thank you very much for sharing with me your journey. And uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Stay safe and stay healthy. Me too. Thank, thank you. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.